I, I want to thank you. Um, I have wanted to come to this conference every year, and I'm standing surrounded by friends and experts uh, and people who have shaped my life uh, as long as I've been in this area. And it's such a joy uh, for me personally uh, to be with you all today. I think that um, what Will didn't say is that I had a pretty good talk about four or five years ago, and I'm afraid I don't know much more since. Maybe things haven't changed. I was struck with the secondary use argument, and again, with all the people coming up, we can talk about that. Uh, I was asked to write a chapter for the short-lived Semino textbook of biomedical informatics called The Future of Biomedical Informatics. No challenge there. So I had to learn about the present of biomedical informatics to try to figure that out. Then I roped in a couple other um, colleagues, Zach Kahani, Ken Mandel, and my friend Valerie Florence from NLM to kind of shape this thing up. And um, we had a couple principles, two of which are relevant here, I think. Um, one is that we believe that every encounter with a patient should be fully informed by all the data you need, principle. Second one is to approach Devin's learning healthcare system notion, every patient encounter should in turn contribute to some form of learning to the patient, to the community, or to the national uh, enterprise. Now, we don't know if those uh, future trends are right or not, but the irony is this is a print textbook, and it's a monster. And so we started writing this about two years ago, and um, it's still not out. So um, we had a choice of continuing to updating and said, hey, what the heck, we had our control, things move fast. Let's see when the book comes out if we were right about this stuff. So any month now, I guess we're going to find out whether or not we were right about some of these things. Um, Today, I want to talk about HIE from a different approach. I want to summarize some work that much of you know and just a very high level view. My primary goal is to stimulate some questions and answers for the very informed group of people that will be talking with you the rest of the day and to basically take an approach that maybe we ought to think of this more from an engineering perspective. Easy for me to say since I'm not an engineer but I have been crashing my head in the wall, as we all have for the same things over and over and over again. So I'm going to talk about th three topics. The first is, what's the current state? Where are we really now? Where have we come? And the next one's going to be what I call the policy labyrinth and how it's getting worse, not better, because of simple combinatorics. And the third is, uh, allude to the notion of what uh, engineered systems for policy would perhaps look like. If you look at the current state of EHR and uh, HIE, um, you see a couple things. This is from a recent study uh, that came out about how people are using it. It's from the ARC Ambulatory Care Survey. And on the left-hand side, you see the axes of what percentage of physician groups are using uh, EHRs at this time from that survey. Again, it's about a year too old. And you see 58% with big groups, and the small practitioners are pretty well down because the ASP kind of models really haven't taken off yet. And then on the x-axis is how frequently do they use uh, various features and functionalities. And you'll see the obvious things, demographics and some notes and meds are way up there. And you go down a lot, and uh, particularly the full record for patients is still very much a work in progress. These numbers change all the time. But I just didn't put a dot there or anything, just to give you an idea of the trends. Now, there's other studies that are uh, in publication that point out that if you take a large group and you look at how uh, practitioners within the practice use the features and functionalities, they all do it a little bit differently. And I bet the cardiology group sees that too. Some use some features, some use others. So there's still a, it's a very much an early in the game, an early mix. And this is a, a piece from Melinda Bunton and colleagues, uh, I think uh, Blumenthal was on this in Health Affairs, about taking a look at all of the studies about the benefits of HIE. Again, of course, you don't, um, don't do as well if you publish a, a study that says HIE, or EHRs rather, really don't work. So there's probably a little bit of a bias here. But nonetheless, Melinda did a very comprehensive view of what it is. And you see there from the green that there are uh, a lot of advocates, a lot of studies that talk about care efficiency down at the bottom. But you also see a disturbing amount of blues about provider satisfaction. Then you go to the other extreme, to the Senate hearings and to other um, recent testimony. And uh, certainly when I see some of my friends who are real doctors, I have to put a bag over my head because they are so frustrated with the EHRs that have been imposed on them and just shoved down their throat. It's, it's, there's a lot of frustration out there. So the real question is, why isn't everybody satisfied? What was wrong? I mean, we had this whole industry that said billions and billions of dollars would be saved. We had this mythical man-month idea that if we threw twice as much money into something, we could affect 
cultural change twice as fast. You know, the very notion that EHR adoption and, and that sort of culture change could be viewed as a stimulus was, to me, kind of irrational. I was critical of it. I was afraid it would have to go too fast. But in retrospect, I have to tell you, I'm glad the horse is out of the barn. I'm glad that we've got a bunch of stuff that doesn't work as well as we'd like it to do, because if we didn't have that, I don't think we'd be anywhere near where we are. Similarly, I think that if you look at the federal standards initiatives, some things are coming very clear, but they're leading to a whole new level of problems and conundrums, some of which I think are intractable. But again, had we not had that kind of push, had we not had that kind of leadership, we wouldn't even know what we don't know. And so overall, I think given the cliff we're facing in terms of practice transformation, cultural transformation, complete organization the way we do medicine based on demographics alone, it's better that we have some stuff to work with than we don't, okay? So why aren't they satisfied? Well, I think um, a lot of clinicians have really high hopes for the EHRs. I mean, they want to do everything as they should. I mean, I ought to get some immediate return. You know, um, Atul Gawande's article in New Yorker talked about the difference between hand washing and anesthetics and pointed out that anesthetics were adopted right away like mad because anesthetics not, didn't just ple improve the patient's life, they improved the surgeon's life because you didn't have these people screaming all the time holding them down. Whereas hand washing was a much more subtle, long-term thing. And so you can imagine back in the day in the 1850s now, there'd be um, some health policy analysts, and I think I know who they'd be, who would be doing papers on the return on investment and estimations and expert panels for hand washing. And the point is, it's very elusive because hand washing and things like that, you don't see an immediate return. You don't see the people who actually have to wash their hands see much tangible difference. So it's a very different cultural change. And I think EHRs are, in many respects, more like hand washing than they are like anesthesia. They get some wins, they get some losses, and uh, that's where you are. They don't make us smarter. They uh, emphasize, many of them, coding and transactions. I mean, the point is to do uh, you might not see as many patients, but get more RBRVS because you're actually capturing what you do. But for many systems, charge capture is the real basis of these things. It always has been, and it continues to be that way. If we move to bundle payments, it will not change because we'll still have to use the same lingo franca to figure out what our attribution was. So there's a whole bunch of things that I think I've listed here that uh, physicians would like to see happen with their EHRs, and they're not. So it's kind of like they're not really designed for our clinicians. The workflow issue has already come up. They're not designed for that. They're not designed for the kind of intimate privacy issues. Uh, they're not designed to integrate information easily into the EHRs. There's just a lot of work that has to be done. But to be critical of what's taking place now is to be critical of the first horseless carriages. We are so early in this game that I think the biggest problem is just people expect quick wins and magic. We forget how long it takes for society and the culture to get used to a new thing. Look at digital music and the revolution, how long it's taken, and even now for rights management, that sort of thing. Look at how uh, the introduction of the photocopy machine led to the uh, Millennium Copyright a Copyright Act in the 60s, and then with the electronic stuff, with perfect digital uh, replicas, a millennial copyright in uh, the 1996, I think it was. So society, when it gets these huge opportunities to fundamentally change the way we record and trans transmit and communicate information. We don't really know the value of that. The people who want to buy it don't know the value of it. Uh, and so buyers and, and sellers, it takes a while to come to some common agreement. It's just something people have to work out because nobody knows a priori the, the answer. So I think another way to help think about this whole issue is to look at it from the perspective of um, a paper that Wang and Christensen wrote, and that in turn was based on a Norwegian paper. And basically remember that a, a medical practice is often three different things. The first thing it is is what they call a problem solving or solution shop. I come in, I've got abdominal pain. So you try to take that uh, filter of all diagnosis and reduce entropy as quickly as possible, get a diagnosis. For that, you'd say, well, you know, you ought to charge by the hour, like a mechanic would. I'll have to take a look, it'll take me a couple hours, I'll figure it out. Second part of healthcare, though, is once you know what's going on, like acute coronary syndrome, then in a hospital, we've got this beautiful Six Sigma, A, B, C, D, everything ought to work just like fine, and we ought to be able to get a great consistent output every time, okay? But the third part of a healthcare enterprise is really the transactions it does with others. It's more like a stock market. 
And so ideas are going back and forth, and that's got a completely different value proposition. So when you say, how is your medical practice going, and give me a metric to show me your performance, I'd say, well, you can't. I'm three different businesses. I'm a problem-solving shop like McKinsey Consultant. I'm a manufacturing process like Toyota Assembly Line. And then I'm a stock exchange, sending information back and forth. I mean, I'm three different businesses, at least, all that. And that's just from the mechanical view. So again, we have this notion, particularly in hospitals, that life is like a conveyor belt. And you just do these processes either sequentially or asynchronously, and you get them all done. And you shoot for a Six Sigma reproducible process, right? And that's where it is. But really, in ambulatory care, it's completely different. Because in ambulatory care, it, people go to five to 10 different doctors. And unless they all go to the same system, it's kind of like I'm going to build my own car. So first, I'm going to get a frame and some tires. I'll get the frame from GM. I'll get the tires from Goodyear. Then I'll get the interior I like from Nissan. And I'll get the body I, I love from Kia's that I wrote in yesterday. And I'll get an engine from Ford. And then I'll get ready to hop in my car and drive away and realize I don't have a transmission. because. I don't have a common plan. I don't have a common view. I got eight different people taking care of it, and we're all shooting in the dark. So in that environment, I think it's great that our communities deliver one or two Sigma practices. I mean, I really do. I, I don't think Six Sigma is possible because we don't have a common plan. We don't have a common knowledge base. So the whole point of motivating HIE has always been, in my mind, to allow us, again, to say that when I see a patient that it is my decisions are informed by every bit of information that is necessary to do the very best job. So they've been more like a giant data sharing bucket, and it's been huge. I mean, as people have said here in the Q&A, as we all know, the ignorance of information, the lack thereof, does lead to a lot of uh, problems in terms of quality of care, uh, redundant tests, et cetera, et cetera. That's been going over many, many times. So back in 2004, high tech, uh, subsequently, they took the momentum of state HIEs, and they said, well, states can play a role in that in communities. And remember, we had the uh, Rio uh, kind of experience kind of anchoring our concept of what information sharing should be. And um, the problem has been that it depends very much how you look at it. This, next, this slide is from one of the reports to the Policy Committee by ONC. And it really says, hey, most of the states are really doing stuff. Look at all these transactions, and only four states really don't do anything. Uh, there's some traction. And indeed, uh, in some states, there's a great amount of traction, and everyone has learned a great deal. But then if you look earlier at Mickey Tripathi's wonderful presentation in January of that year to the Hit Policy Committee, which is really worth looking at. Every slide is a gem. He shows you that if you look at those um, actual transactions, there's a very skewed distribution. You have four or five states that are accountable for the vast majority. So it depends how I'm going to tell you the number. If I'm going to tell you the number of states, I can give you a big number. If I'm going to tell you the average transactions, I can give you a so-so number. But if I really look at the distribution of transactions, it's not. So each of these states is somehow different in its models, its design, its culture, its history, its technology, something. So it's working for some people to some degree. And it's really just in its early stages than others. So it's too soon to tell. The other thing that Mickey did a better job at than I've ever done is make the case that HIE is a verb and not a noun. And that's a relief to many of us. Uh, and he talks a lot about comparing and contrasting what the purpose of HIE was then and what it is now, where the market's going, and where the real thrusts are and the real emphasis in all of our practices. And so he's really talking a lot about the notion that we're seeing these things more as enterprise HIEs, i.e. people who want to form ACOs, who have strategic partnerships. So rather than have just one HIE in a uh, service in a community, instead you may have three or four very deep, heavily regulated, controlled for business reasons, exchanges with contractual relationships where people under like CIN or ACO rules can actually share data without antitrust. And then you have other people in a vacuum, and some people are in both. So what you have then is a bunch of clouds of HIE initiatives within a community that represent really uh, strong practice alliances uh, among generally competitors. And you have a lot of people who are sitting between the clouds and working with several of them. You also have, of course, plan-based uh, clouds as well, and they have a lot of push. In fact, if you look at, so you've got these clouds and you say, well, then how do I make a community HIE if I don't have one? And the only thing I can think of is that we use some of the things that David Kibbe and other people can talk about, direct trust and other uh, intermediaries, if you will, to exchange the transactions when people go from a cloud to a cloud. So in a sense, 
we allow the vast majority then of the care that's provided hopefully is in that cloud, but when it's not, we can create some new form and send the information over for a smaller amount. So we've reduced the search space, we've reduced the regulatory requirements, and we've reduced the uh, number of trusted parties to a much limited number of set who are used to working with each other. That's my hope. And of course, health plans are really getting into this um, because health plans are the de facto, if you will, source of all data, as you well know, trying to get information about a patient in the absence of a robust health information exchange is virtually impossible. Only the plans have it. I always loved it in the you know, mid-decade, last decade, when plans would say things like, we have a claims-based electronic health record, which to me, that's not saying I have a coal-fired jet turbine. I just don't know what that means. But, you know, they said that's a big deal. And I remember in Memphis where we built the HIE, uh, a health plan, real great one, just came in and said, we'll give you all the claims data. And the doc said, what do I want that for? I got all the clinical data. I don't need your claims data to figure out what's going on because I know how I can make those claims. I got the real thing. And, but the plan seeing this, of course, for their own reasons, because they're struck between a narcissistic American society that doesn't want to pay very much and very demanding clinicians are, are of necessity trying to fill this gap. So you see particularly the big guys buying HIE vendors, you see them getting in the data analytics space, you see like United creating Optum and separating as much as possible. Cygnus kind of doing a little bit of that, Aetna's doing a lot of that. So the plans are rolling around there too, trying to build their own clouds, each with several different uh, HIE specifications, all kind of the same. So my conclusion is just that the EMR and HIE landscape is changing a lot. It's moving from me sitting down and recording something to the understanding that the uh, electronic health record is not a diary, it's a communication device, it's a telephone. Uh, it is really about me communicating with other people and sharing information, one record, one plan. So what about the labyrinth of policy and technology? Um, in, the, in the days when we ran the Memphis HIE, it was, uh, we had very few options. We had a global opt-out, we had an opt-out at the institution, some people opt-in, uh, that's still prevalent today, you know, some people can separate certain, so you just feed it in and out. But the beautiful thing is with these still, it's like a big bucket and you just decide what goes in. But once it goes in, pretty well then, everybody gets to see it. Just like if I send something to your hospital, I can say it's only for this doctor, but if it goes in the hospital EHR, most hospital systems, anybody that needs to see it will get to see it. So you throw it into that bucket. And so in a sense, the problem with the governance of, of those structures is when you wanted to go the next level and create accountable care relationships or other things, you ran into two problems. One is antitrust. And the second is when you sit around with a board of people who are willing to do some stuff for the global good, but are really still competing like mad, you can't say, hey, I'd like to have our HIO do this sort of specialized stuff because if I do this, I can really kick your tail and steal some of your cardiologists away from it. It's just not a particularly governable thing because at some point the common good uh, really drops down into sectarian warfare which is why I think even when you see a few communities with great common uh, health information exchange capabilities, you're seeing each of the organizations for various purposes building um, enterprise health exchange to talk to different groups. And of course, along that cloud, don't forget, meanwhile, uh, direct messages are sitting around all over the place. So everybody can send messages to anybody else the way they want, and if things go well, and you'll hear more about this this afternoon, there'll be a lot more of that. So if I'm trying to study the financial impact of health information exchange, I'm not even sure how I do it anymore because the model that I can compare the people who share a common repository versus those who stand alone doesn't work because there's so many different ways we get information now. So it's going to call for a whole new kind of analysis. But then what happens when you basically can get information from multiple sources? What happens, and I hope you can't understand this, is that you, um, you can get a real confusing mess. The bottom line of this is basically from B on the second column is sending information to everybody, A through G. The orthogonal thing is just everybody's obviously generally can access their own information. There are a few exceptions, actually, sadly. But it basically, B is sending information to everybody. But wait a minute, you know, if B is sending information to everybody, um, what's happening down here? C is sending information to um, A, B, C, or, but C is not getting information back from A. That's what that red dot's for. So the bottom line is, when it, messages are sitting all around, I'm going to, some people are going to have a lot of stuff. Some people are going to have an incomplete picture. And more important than that, some people are going to get duplicates. We know this in the immunization registry problem where state registries, sometimes the dates of the transactions will be off by a day and you can't correlate yours. And we know this in spades and medication histories. 
we're trying to merge all these records. So when we're talking about the freedom of all these direct messages, when we actually need to put it together, as has been implied, it is a huge problem to cull out the redundancies to see what's new and all. And I'm just not quite sure how that's going to fit into the technology and the workflow. And the other thing, as Devin said, uh, my view is just really important that the omnibus rule says everybody's got to pay attention. In the old days, I'm sorry, uh, most people use, it's true, most uses of HIPAA, I think, were to basically to stop stuff or were actually wrong. A few people had to know kind of HIPAA and make sure you didn't do something really bad. Although I remember one study where um, a number was sent out wrong. And so rather than getting a public health agency receiving all these faxes about uh, reportable diseases, some garage in another state was receiving facts after facts after facts. That's incidental disclosure on a grand scale, I guess. But the point is, it was only a province of the Illuminati. And it had a different pace to it. And you could kind of talk about it because breaches weren't enforced. And it, particularly at a small hospital, you didn't worry about it because you just, it didn't touch you. You had to worry about your plan and a few things. But now we say everybody's got to get connected. So every medical records person, every hospital lawyer say, what? So I have to send messages all over the place? I don't know if our policies allow that. So in many, many instances, you have institutions say, I don't care what the law says. I'm not going to send out that information because our policies don't allow it without a signed authorization. I mean, there's a bunch of crazy stuff. So instead of having just a couple hundred or maybe a thousand people really worrying about this now, somebody from every organization in the United States has got to take it seriously because stuff is connecting to them. And so they have to be responsible. So there's an order of magnitude difference in the number of people engaged in the debate. And the learning curve is very different. You know, in the old days, we had the HISPIC thing, which was states sitting around and talking. That was a very educational informative thing, but I think we looked at state policies because that's all we had. But there's a lot more to the world than state policies, and it was only a few people, and it didn't really get us as far as we wanted. And that was just the states, and I'm going to in a minute explain why it's much, much worse now. Um, what's it cost? I would love to know the real cost of the omnibus rule. I would love to know the real cost of the HIPAA enforcement, the best I can find, and maybe Walter Sajansky or some of the other people out here can give me a better number. This is from uh, Peter Kilbridge in an article he estimated about the cost with the American Hospital Association data in the New England Journal. I'm saying the real cost is much higher than we say. If I remember right, the budget uh, justification for the omnibus rule basically said the only cost is we have to change our notification of privacy practices is this X dollars per hour times lawyers times this number of lawyers is cheap. Don't worry about it. That's not what I'm seeing. It's carnage out there. It's a learning curve. It, it's a frenzy and a banana. So we know that there's an enormous cost we face, and we've got to find a way to simplify that. The other thing, I, I try to call, call it a policy pipe, because if A wants to send something to B, and we have a direct message, we have all these implicit understandings about each other. But when you really think of how that goes, well, it's got to be in conformance with HIPAA. It's got to be in conformance with the state or states. It's got to be in conformance with your own institutional policies. And if you're a member of an accountable care organization or something else, it's got to be consistent with all those business rules, too. So you've got to align a whole bunch of rule systems together. And with the exception of the ACOs, all any of these rules can do is make it more restrictive. So if HIPAA alone, I could, if I could get 100 messages out legally, I could ideally get 100 messages. When I add an institutional policy that's flawed, I may cut that down to 70. I get a state law, I might count it down to 60. If I have an ACO law, I might count it down more, or the ACO might have a completely different system in the back end that has everything, no matter what my consent is, for other purposes, more like a health plan. So this business of what's research, what's TPO, whatever, is going to be very confusing because we're dealing with several states. So I call it the policy pipe. I used to call it policy gauntlet. And so when you model privacy systems, you've got to make sure that it goes through in a predictable way all the way along. So other than that, there's no problems. I mean, authorization, easy. <laughs> Authentication, easy. Consent, ah. No problem at all, right? Not none. I love Melissa Goldstein's work there saying that if you give people more choices, uh, they get more confused. If you spend too much time obtaining consent, which some of our people think you just spend all your time getting consent, patients are smart enough in studies to say, hey, this is coming at the expense of my medical care. And I didn't come in here to go over the notification of privacy practices form for 45 minutes of my five minute talk with my doctor. And so there's an enormous amount of social complexity. What does consent mean? And you know, when we're healthy, oh, I don't want to consent to anything, it's fine. When we're critically ill, please, whatever, I'm the ultimate information altruist, you know? And so consent changes as a matter of context, and there's no way a priori we know. 
which means any consent provisions have to be continually revised, which is why, call me old-fashioned, trust your doctors and your clinicians to do the right thing. But anyway, provenance, where did it come from? The whole business of retransmission, I'm sure that won't come up at all today. Um, cash payments, we, I left poop, that was the big take home today. And the other thing is we use words distantly, in, in, uh, inconsistent ontologies for words. Laws, state laws are by definition vague. Uh, some mental health laws say mental institutions, some say mental health services, but don't define what they are. As you know, if you're military, the that, that provisions of those laws deal medical, mental health different than something else. But just an, a, a, a really just basically an ontology of mental health, or an ontology of consent, which some people have done from uh, clinical practices, is really important to work out on. And, and again, this is the kind of stuff that there are some really great groups out there trying to at least work through in theory, but it's nowhere near realizable in practice. So we got a few pro policy and technical issues ahead of us. Finally, policy is an engineered system. What do I mean? We have spent a lot of time trying to do the following. We've tried to basically take policies, a group at MIT has done this with other laws, and try to take every clause and represent it as a basically a logical statement, a prologue statement, so that you can have a set of assertions from one law and a set of assertions from the other, and then you can compare the logic and see if they contradict or if they supersede or if there's gaps or whatever, a beautiful thought. And we went merrily down that road for about two and a half years, only to find out that it's futile because the policies turn on themselves, they're ambiguous, and you can't do it that way. What we found much more successful is say, I'm going to take this use case, okay? And I'm going to take the use case and I'm just going to stack up all the policies and just shoot a bullet through and say, what part of these policies apply to that use case? I'm going to look at those and then I'm going to sit down and say, what do they mean? What does a mental health disorder mean? Well, they don't say. Okay, so we're going to say they mean this, okay? We're just going to declare they mean this. And we're going to say this policy lines up with that and that's what this policy means. So we basically do more of the knowledge engineering thing and create declarative things based on our best judgment, not on a word-for-word -word translation. And then we punch that back out in the policy space and say, we dare you to show us that we're wrong or this is any less consistent or more screwed up than what we're currently doing, which of course will win. So, but none of we've gotten some uh, real traction on this, but not as much as we like. But going the other way, by just saying first principles, do the obvious thing, create a system so that 80% of the responses can be uh, immediately done. Okay, I've got a transaction from you. You see this patient. I've known this before. I got in the database. You've got assertion to this. Boom. Off you go. And a few that are oddballs, you'd send over to a human being. So we, we think we have a good approach. And again, our goal is not just one record, but a single coordinated care plan. Because another important thing is if we're doing all this time to model policies, don't just model the policies. It's just kind of trivial technically, not maybe in its development, to add more than just you have a right to open this record for these things. But you can also say, and you are in this ACO, and it is your job to do these three tests. So all of a sudden then what becomes a just general consent message becomes a data structure, if you will, for a plan where certain people are given certain responsibilities to structure that plan. And there are people here who are very hard at work uh, building structured systems that will do that, which will really take diverse systems and not just allow access through standards, but assert, according to my rules here, you're the guy that ought to be doing this test. And so that's going to be an exciting time when we really get to that. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to basically engineer, closed loop engineer provably build systems that are simple, dumb systems and see how far we can get taking that approach because we don't think the other approach is going to get us very far. It's going to lead to morass. So, you know, you look at the barriers, you look at the inconsistencies, you take an explicit position, you model it, you do it, you look, look again, you follow it up and then you go after it. And so that leads us then to engineered systems that we're already doing in oncology protocols and other things where you look at boundary conditions and you help figure out decision support. So it links a bunch of informatics research and operations research issues together in a, in a good way, I think. We've got a little uh, system we call Policy Forge, which is just kind of a website right now. It's used by uh, the Vanderbilt engineering crowd for a prod competition called Vehicle Forge that does same explicit formal modeling languages, uh, incomprehensible second order logic stuff to f uh, for a competition for DARPA to design an advanced um, military vehicle. And there's different parts, drivetrain, chassis, and all that. And each one of these competitions is leading to millions of dollars in prizes. So this platform that we're sitting on top of is certainly secure because people got a lot of money at stake. And we're going to just see how far we get with that. 
The other thing is we think collaboration technologies have been totally underwhelmed. It, it has been so cool just to take a few graduate students and postdocs and say, circle all the things you think have something to do about mental health in these three state laws and discuss and see what their different views are. And we think a lot of this can be done for the important things among uh, health privacy professionals who don't have really a forum to do it. So in the end of that, what we're really trying to do again is identify a need, a problem we need to solve, an explicit problem we need to solve, basically mark it up, look at the models, model the system out, and then test it against what we've modeled about the policy and do the best we can. But when we have no other recourse, we just make the call. We say, these drugs are psychiatric drugs, these are not. And we know we can get more expansive along the way. So I'm, the third part of this is just to say, maybe there's a different approach. Maybe we have to just kind of engineer it first better. Uh, Governor Bredesen in his 200, 2007 Governor of Tennessee, him's keynote, uh, he, he was a Harvard physics major, computer scientist who uh, formed the largest for-profit HMO in America, then he became mayor of Nashville, then governor of Tennessee, so he's no fool. But he kind of went modestly to hymns and said, I can't tell you what to do. I can tell you how to be successful. I can't tell you what to do technically. He'd read everything of the policies and stuff. And he said, I have three rules for you. One, build version 1.0 first. They're all trying to have you build version 6.0. No, build version 1.0 first. Two, focus on one thing. Do one thing well. So that when you yap at me, I know you actually can do something and you don't just talk. And the third thing, ignore the Illuminati and the expert users and build something for the common guy and do that. He did that, you'll be successful, and he has. So in summary, I'll just throw a few more ideas out for the rest of the discussion. Um, the, the new technologies are being thrown at us. You know, we can't keep control of what's happening with mobile computers and healthcare settings and patients or anything else. We can't possibly stay ahead of, the regu uh, of this by regulation. There's just no way, okay? And so, again, and then when you look at how long it takes a market to mature, Michael Porter says about five years, to understand how this stuff fits in, it just takes time and patience and analysis. You can't, in general, cram it down people's phone. Can you imagine federal policies for how you use your telephone? Kind of interesting, we had that once, I guess. Um, our, the other thing we talked about workflows, and we are not in modeling the right workflows. We're not modeling privacy-aware workflows. We're not modeling a workflows in our own offices with the idea that we're just a node on a vaster network for these other needs, right? Um, buyers and sellers, like I said, Michael Porter, it's immature. Our reimbursement skit systems, of course, are absolutely schizophrenic. It used to be bad when just I was in it completely. The more I do, the more I get paid. And the plan, the less I do, the more they get paid. And now half of my patients, the more I do, the more I get paid. The other half, the less I do, the more I get paid. So, you know, it's, it's kind of crazy out there. Um, incentives are misaligned all the way up and down the line because people in a medical practice office want to do the right thing the same way for everybody, right? Um, I think we'll have a patchwork, and that'll be HIE, the verb. Uh, I'm very heartened by um, the potential uh, for some of the simple protocols and the simple data standards to work. I mean... I am seeing across the country a whole cadre of healthcare IT professionals who have to own this, beginning to own this. Meaningful use has been sort of a threat, obviously. But once they start thinking about it, they say, you know, this could solve some of my other problems too. In fact, I can use the meaningful use bugaboo in my hospital to re-engineer a whole bunch of stuff I wanted to do anyway, but I couldn't get the power. But now I can say, just like people misuse HIPAA, meaningful use makes you do that. And it really works. It's not a bad strategy at all. Nobody calls you on it. And um, I think, again, we, the federated HIE model, the business relationships, is a step. And the trick is to uh, fit those tighter business relationships, more tightly governed, with the greater space that's represented by a regional H H HIE effort. And I think that can be really done. And uh, as uh, even though I wrote a, a chapter about the future and Peter Drucker said that you don't have to, you don't have to uh, be stupid to guess about the future, but he said if you look right around you, at everything that you're seeing, connect the dots, and there's all kinds of stuff going on, and that will be the future. It's right there in front of you, it's just you're not focusing on it the right way yet. So Drucker is kind of an inspiration, but I still think Yogi Berra might have had it right when he said, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. So that's where we are, that's where we're heading, and I think we're in for a good day, thanks. Uh, no. Not, 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 well, let's put it this way. There are people that you'll be hearing from later that have thought through this a lot better than I. I'm, I'm just, I'm planning to 
uh, kind of hiding under the bar with a bottle of a good red wine and, and hope it calms down. But um, it, it's, the other thing is it, it's churning that we're going to have. It's churning that we have in paper charts now. I mean, people get this big chart, and uh, you don't have to put it all in your medical record. So a specialist will uh, take the part that they need, scan it, shred the rest. Of course, if it's a big institution, then the patient comes, and they have these other problems too, but the specialist has shredded that other stuff, stuff you've alluded to. So we're just, we've already had that mess, and this is going to force us to declare it. But I uh, know I can't comment other than that. Uh, yeah, tonight. Let's let's work on that. I'll have a workshop. Uh, it'll be about um, twenty dollars per person plus you buy the wine, and I will be there, and I'll give you my best techniques. And I will also show you how at least fifty percent of the time you can stand up again when it's over. So, yes. Hi. Agreed. I I, I um first of all find me by email. We'll set you up. It gets lonely. Uh, um, People don't talk to us much. And so consent, there's two ways of looking at consent. One is to put that in the policy pipeline and say that's just another policy that changes, and that's the way we kind of treat it. Uh, the second is to say it's all about consent, and that models everything, and that in turn then dictates what else happens, which is kind of like saying if you wanted to really build a responsive engineered uh, switch for health information exchange, You'd start by building a high performance audit log machine that could guarantee you, tell you, tell you what happened and make the transmission of the thing an after effect. So, in a way, um, the um, notion of consent is a part of the, an individual's right to stand up and stand against the public interest. Sometimes you win, sometimes, if it's a reportable disease, you don't. But consent is just looming out there and uh, Nothing I've seen modeling that yet is quite there, primarily because a lot of our favorite standard organizations always make things five times more complicated than it's got to be. But I think that, that is, if we could figure that out, that's particularly huge if Chris Shute and others talk about secondary data use, how you do that. Consent for what? For what trial? For what scope? For what duration? With the exception of what? I mean, I can create, again, logical formula that I'll show you will just implode on themselves and allow you to do nothing. But what's the right general way that basically does the simple thing, which is to say, I trust this glob system that's got my stuff. At the end of the day, if we just could trust that, I think a lot of this will go away. Great question. Yes, you and then you. I'm really um, quite compelled by Bill Yasnov stuff, Latanya Sweeney stuff, and the stuff that came before. And I really think that has to be respected. I think that now that I think the AMA survey says that 24% of the money you spend comes out of pocket, consumers are getting a greater sense of uh, price sensitivity and microeconomic basis to this stuff. And I think that's going to get higher. And so I think there's going to be a cadre of people that are very large. You read Regina Herzlinger, who killed healthcare, this wonderful tirade, and she'll say it doesn't take many people to really uh, do that. So another innovative approach to HIE is to try to figure out how to mesh a uh, Sweeney or a Yasno thing with it. Because Clayton Christensen said it very well one time. He said, you know, he always talked about what job do you hire something to do? What do you hire a milkshake to do? And somebody asked him, what job do you hire the healthcare system to do? He says, well, the problem is 85% of America doesn't want to hire the healthcare system to do anything because they don't think they need it right now. And so the real point is how do you get that degree of engagement knowing at the same time that there will be other people responsible for the, the general questions of the people who do not choose to be so engaged. I think that's a, another wonderful collision of worlds that could provide a new opportunity and a better solution. Yes, we're, we're wrestling with the particularly what, uh, what's called poop. I mean, the, the, the choice you can make either in advance or later on evidently for something to not be out. That's hard to do. Hospitals don't know how to do that at all. In fact, I think the only way is to you register under a different name or some alias and do it off, off the books. Uh, but I, I, we have not worked with the primary care physicians, but that's an exciting model because that takes you out of the whole space. And that takes you purely into a consent-based, consumer-mediated kind of approach. I mean, I can imagine in my ideal world uh, a, a um, high, uh, high deductible, catastrophic health insurance, voluntary thing where I or whoever I do owns my data and it goes up from there. 
and you start with that and then you fit in the more general policy, not the other way around. I don't think they're incompatible at all, but I'm, it's a long way of saying no, we just are really afraid of it. Okay, and we're not, we're just, we're not, I'm not running a uh, health exchange effort anymore and I'm just spending around, a lot of time going around trying to think about what the big problems are and you're on to not a big problem, a great opportunity. Um, thanks, thanks again. Mark.